All right. Thanks everyone for joining. We're going to get started with the Research Translational Committee Partnership Seminar Series, which is um, hopefully turning out to be a really informative um, uh, approach to seminars for the TRI community to really provide exemplars of how partnerships can be used to achieve uh, translation and impact of our research. Today, we're fortunate to have a presentation jointly by Dr. Drota Palak and Professor Josephine Forbes um, through their partnership focused on trying to address the challenge of type 1 diabetes. So Drota has been the JDRF Australia Chief Scientist, Scientific Officer since September 2019 and has been with JDRF for more than 13 years prior to which she was at the Children's Hospital in Boston. JDRF is one of the largest international philanthropic organisations and has taken an innovative approach um, actively engaging with both researchers and consumers consumers to promote um, uh, uh, research to improve the lives of people with type 1 diabetes and to ultimately find cures. JDRF has provided leadership towards driving global research connectedness, including with community, and provided leadership, not just funding, towards delivering on their vision. So um, we'll start with uh, Daroche first and then um, Joe Forbes will speak, who's um, a program leader for the chronic diseases uh, program at Marta Research and also leads the glycation and diabetes complication research group at Marta. She's had significant funding from uh, JDRF as well as other funders like NHMRC and NIH and has made outstanding contributions um, to trying to solve the complications of diabetes, which has been recognised by by significant awards, including the Commonwealth Health Minister's Award for Excellence in Medical Research. Um, she's a biomedical scientist, but she's built impressive um, clinical research networks as well as industry partnerships towards delivering new therapies for reducing complications associated with diabetes. So welcome to both of you, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Alison. And, um... Uh, thank you for that beautiful outline of JDRF's purpose, which is um, spot on. And um, I'm delighted to be here with Josie, who, uh, Josie, I hope you don't mind me saying it, but you have been like a poster child for JDRF because you really started with us very early in your career, been supported through a number of career projects and, um, and um, have been really instrumental in driving um, a number of our initiatives forward. So I'm really privileged to be here in your company. Um, the JDRF's purpose, as you see here, and I'll just be very brief about it. Um, it uh, we are a, a family of organizations that are scattered through different countries, um, with the biggest one being in US, but also in UK, Canada, Australia, and a sprinkling of European countries when there is a smaller presence. Um, I think in terms of the funding um, for research, um, we are probably the um, second largest um, after US. Um, and our vision is very um, simple in a way um, and very difficult in a way as well that we want to achieve a world when there is no more patients with type 1 diabetes. Um, in the meantime, while we're searching for the cure, we are very um, concentrated on working with the community and with the researchers and with the policymakers to make sure that we are improving lives of people living with type 1 diabetes. Um, and while we're searching for that elusive cure, which is, um, of course, not easy to find for the autoimmune condition. To give you the scale of our funding and um, the uh, type 1 diabetes, um, uh, GRF has been funded in 1970 um, in US and a couple of years later here in Australia, and it was a family um, based organization initially it was driven by volunteers and in each individual country later on it grew to be a, a professional non for profit organization. Um, distributing quite a substantial amount of funding over the years um, and also spearheading um, a number of clinical car, uh, car trials in several countries. So we've always been uh, working collectively across different countries with our colleagues. So we have a very big uh, global coordination of our um, uh, research, which I think adds to that um, uh, very um, big family of researchers. Um, so I speak with researchers, um, you know, anywhere in Europe and UK and US, and um, they are very familiar with the um, researchers everywhere. So um, we, uh, as, as 
think what is really important for JDRF and it's in our heart is that connection to the original um, roots, which is the community of people with type 1 diabetes. And this community of people with type 1 diabetes assisted us over the years in, um, in um, accessing um, the government funds through the um, advocacy and through promoting information about type 1 diabetes and its impact. And what happened about 11 years ago that um, through those efforts, we were able to secure sufficient government funds in Australia to establish um, a tap on diabetes clinical research network. Um, you see that in its, in its goal, it's very much um, sits within the um, translation of research and the support of research, which will lead um, to uh, our conversation today about how important this translation. Um, and it's very much patient focused. So what we really want to look at every research that we do and every research decision that we do through that kind of lens of um, what is it going to benefit the patient. Um, and we want to have that relationship with our research community to look at the brands together. Um, because of that, we consider ourselves um, what we call it an engaged funder. It's a funder who likes to work with the research community and have that bridge between type 1 diabetes community. Um, we do like to um, support that um, collaboration across different sectors, whether it's a commercial, whether it is a community, whether it's a translational researchers, uh, whether it is data researchers, whether it is clinicians. Um, we want to make sure that we have that um, leveraged. So we also work often with um, additional funders when we can um, uh, connect the research or hope that we can fund research collectively and provide uh, uh, much more in-depth funding or much more in-depth scope for the researchers. And we closely manage the progress through the milestones, but that's um, uh, that's something that we'll do as a, as a course of action. So you see, in our philosophy, it is we really try to provide a network of tentacles of, in, of um, interrelations between the researchers, and we work, like to work together. Um, in our um, clinical research network, our focus um, is in three pillars. Um, and that focuses on increasing um, the clinical activities in Australia. So making sure that we are moving through the, um, our translational pipeline into the clinical trials and also supporting the translation of early stage science, either through a preclinical work or through the um, increasing the volume of clinical trials. Um, in the, uh, in the whole spectrum of our focus also, it is really important that we work with the researchers and ensure that they are sufficiently enabled and supported to, uh, to, pr to produce those outcomes into the translation and trials. Um, so in that ecosystem that we see as a science, we try to, as a funder, fund not only the projects, but also fund the enabling pathways that those projects can be realized um, in much more fast and productive way and also connected with our global partners. And one of the examples that I wanted to talk about specifically, which relates very closely to the work Josie has done, was how we've actually looked into the acceleration of the translation of the projects. Um, and everyone is aware that, you know, there is the valley of death between the discovery and, and the clinical work. And um, there have been, you know, hundreds and thousands of, um, of you know, approaches that have been tested. And, um, and we have certainly approached it, the same question in type 1 diabetes with the questions of how do we promote the culture of translation? How do we ensure that the type 1 diabetes translational pipeline and opportunities um, are being uniquely addressed through our lens and through our needs? Um, and it's in terms of type 1 diabetes, it's this year marks 100 years of discover of insulin. Um, and it's the only drug that it has been approved for type 1 diabetes. 
since in the 100 years. So we have a long way to go to ensure that we will look for viable drug targets that can be really pushed through that pipeline. And we need to um, address our unique um, challenges that exist in type 1 diabetes that might be different than the ones um, um, seen in cancer and the ones um, seen in other um, diseases. And so with our approach, we have looked, of course, at the, um, the, the kind of the landscape um, what were the market research initiatives that we could um, identify um, as potential uh, targets to move through a translational pipeline? And what were the very unique challenges and gaps that were specific to tap on diabetes as versus to those that were more um, present in the system that, uh, that blocked the translation um, approach for of different um, therapies? Um, we certainly have, um, from this one, um, we have discovered that um, in many cases, the, uh, there are really viable and exciting opportunities in type 1 diabetes space, but they are probably more than other diseases stuck more into the um, uh, you know, discovery and academic uh, type of stage um, and less likely to move towards um, very specific, um, uh, I think, uh, adaptation to the commercial reality. Um, so we, uh, after our um, kind of a quite extensive um, an, uh, understanding of our challenges, we have decided that we need to really um, kind of work together with the available systems and available um, uh, providers who could support our researchers in those initiatives and um, offer them very bespoke um, uh, support that could work in their favor. Um, so when we released our request for application, that was really kind of a scouting for the projects that are specific for, um, uh, for type 1 diabetes, uh, promising discoveries that can be moved towards type 1 diabetes um, therapy, um, we knew that we need to embed certain translational support for the applicants that were considered to be in that stage that it's ripe for a translation. <clears throat> And um, so we we knew that we wanted to um, secure a situation where we um, have these projects that are close to um, translation, that the selection um, identified very likely entrepreneurial tendencies within the researchers, um, and the um, and that also that um, we have asked the institutes to have provide um, a co-funding um, opportunity, and this is really important important because it really means that the institute believes in the researchers and it's willing to put some modest um, support um, and uh, indicates that they are likely to translate so um, and they're likely to put the efforts behind the translation so that was quite an important aspect of that um, looking for um, a successful outcome. And um, when we then partnered with the company and that we have selected a company called Bright Arena, um, we were specifically um, keen to work with them on a very um, kind of a bespoke model of, of engagement. And it is to work with each individual researcher um, on the um, empowering them, them to build their capability um, and to drive their um, potential therapy towards engagement with industry and investments. And it was specifically adjusted to the individual needs of the projects. So as you see in the blue outcome box, we actually scouted 52 projects and we selected five. So there was a very high bar for um, entering into this program. And um, each of those five, five selected individuals that includes, of course, Josie, um, received that very specific support that allowed them to challenge the way they've been approaching their project design um, and shift it from more academic style of design to more suitable for potential investors and industry and, um, and how to accelerate the decision making. So it was um, capability and capacity um, building. And, um, 
those activities were prioritized to really look at the from the patient lens that was something that was very important from us and it was a um a, a mutual decision making between the um the researchers and the support crew in the bright arena and also was further informed by several different conversations with the potential investors um and um and the vcs and the um uh and the industry collaboration so in that sense we were um, aiming to move the research projects relatively quickly through the um, uh, decisions of how the projects are designed, looking at that very much commercial lens of activities and also how they're going to benefit the patient. So all the questions um, around, you know, is it, um, is it commercial viable? Is it competitive? Is it, does it give you the cutting edge? Does it, um, does it uh, provide um, the, the right level of investment? Is it going to be impactful? Um, all those kind of a framework for the decision-making been shared with the researchers and discussed. So I'll I'll stop here, um, but uh, to um, allow Josie to focus a bit more on her project. Uh, but each of the five projects selected received uh, the same level of um, uh, opportunity, and they were also able to pitch um, their projects to the potential investors with the uh, with that new uh, built capability to drive it. Um, so this is the kind of an advantage that we as a funder try to do, to working directly with the researchers, how to um, empower you know the research community on that um, in towards the translation of research, which at the end of it, it really benefits our community. And, um, and that's through that lens, um, we look at um, each of our initiatives um, to try to build uh, much more um, networked um, project based a funding model, rather than just individual um, projects that are disconnected. Um, the program, I think, received relatively positive feedback from the researchers themselves. And certainly it ended up as a um, big success in terms of the leverage and also um, potential outcomes for the participants of the program, um, if how they taking the research to the next stage. So we're very excited about it. Um, and it addresses a very important gap in type one diabetes research, which is the ability to move the products through the translational pipeline to the patient. Um, I am very happy to thank you very much for your time. And um, I am um, keen to hear from Josie how she sees that um, particular project and how she uh, reflects on, on, on its um, impact. Excellent. Thanks, Dorota. If you could stop sharing your screen so that Joe can share hers. We also had a hand raised um, by, uh, now it looks like TRI Events has raised it, which is me. So that, or, or, I, just, or I just did it. <laughs> I think we had a hand raised by somebody during that. So um, we prefer to leave questions to the end. So unless it was a technical issue, um, which you could mention in the chat, um, I, I won't take questions now. So Thanks, Joe. if you could start sharing your screen. Yes, yeah, so please let me know that it's in the correct presenter view because I'm using two screens. So just double check that. So you should have the proper presenter view of as of now. Is that right? Nope, we haven't got anything yet, Joe. I've got no slides. Okay, hold on, let's try again. Okay, we can. Yeah, yep. and I'll just pop it into presenter view, and you should have the slides in front of you now. We Is do. That right? Perfect. Fantastic. Yep, okay, great. so um, look, it's my very great privilege to present my JDRF Pilot Innovation Award, which was something that I received from JDRF to, I guess, move forward some of the work that we've been doing, looking at a novel therapeutic for diabetic kidney disease in type one diabetes. Um, a very quick thank you to JDRF and their donors. Um, certainly, I have been a child of JDRF for a very long time. Uh, about 2002, I was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship as a very green researcher, um, and I've been very privileged to receive numerous levels of support over the years, both from JDRF Australia and JDRF International, so a very big thank you. Um, I wanted to actually start with this 
Pathfinder canvas. And I guess what I wanted to do was get you thinking about what we really were looking at when we were thinking about a project, which was something that was translational. Um, this was one of the first things that Bright Arena gave to me and I looked at it and went, oh, that looks pretty scary and awful and big. But actually, when you look at all of the questions which are under each of these things, it actually makes made me reflect on both looking in towards my project and actually looking out to see what other people who were looking at my project were thinking about. Um, and so... I would encourage anybody who's doing translational research to actually find this type of Pathfinder canvas. This is a particular one that was um, made by Bright Arena, but there are certainly um, versions of this out on the internet. And think about each of these questions quite deeply because they actually encourage you to think about the scope of your project. And I think that was something that I really did not appreciate when I began this journey. But certainly um, thinking about diabetes, we all know that this is a really significant problem. There are about probably about 150,000 Australian individuals who are affected by type one diabetes, which makes up about 10% of the cases of diabetes in Australia, but makes up close to 40% of the cost. And the reason for that is because of its early life onset, which increases the risk for complications in later life. And the complications of diabetes don't generally come as one complication, we usually see them as a part of a syndrome. I'm particularly interested in kidney disease because this is a major risk factor for heart attacks and strokes and early death, and is almost always found alongside some of these other really serious and um, socially difficult complications of diabetes that develop. And certainly we, we appear to have a lot of therapies for diabetic kidney disease, which are on the market. And there are various levels of this, including, you know, your exercise nutrition based things, some very new brand new um, therapies, which target glucose. Um, but none of these therapies are actually addressing the clinical needs of diabetic kidney disease. In fact, when you add them all together, they only reduce your risk by about 30%. So when you look at that pyramid, that's extremely disappointing. And there's about 60 to 70% of progression in diabetic kidney disease towards death and cardiovascular disease, which is not being addressed. And in fact, the reason for that is because actually many of the people who die from diabetes every year are actually under the age of 60. And quite disappointingly, when you look at the very large scale clinical trials, which are done for cardiovascular and kidney disease in diabetes, the average age of participants is over the age of 60. And so perhaps what is happening is that there are the wrong people or the wrong types of patient populations which are being targeted. And certainly we believe this is potentially the case in diabetes. So we believe that they're being tested in limited patient populations who actually aren't the people who are getting the most strict, the most um, severe versions of diabetic kidney disease. Certainly there are large numbers of these patients, but they are not the ones who are going on to early death. We also believe that many of the therapies that are available actually don't work in younger patients. And this has been shown in recent clinical trials, which MARTA itself were involved in as well, this clinical trial called ADDIT, which actually showed that two of the major therapies which were used in adults with diabetic kidney disease actually do not work in young people who already have developed diabetic kidney disease. And as you know, with, I'm sure with your diseases that you're looking at, many patients don't comply to other, particularly lifestyle interventions, which may also help um, things like dietary interventions, weight loss and other things. But these aren't as relevant for type one diabetes where these things are not necessarily a problem. Um, and so our therapy actually concentrates on these energetic uh, little organelles called mitochondria. And we all know how important they are for our body's function. They consume the oxygen we breathe to produce ATP, which is essentially a battery storage unit, which is enabled to be transported around the body um, and basically provides the energy for every process that we do in our body. Um, but what you probably don't know is that the kidneys have a disproportionately high number of these mitochondria. And the reason for this is because the kidneys undergo many processes which are actually energetically dependent. They recycle, they produce glucose, they make hormones for bone and blood health, and they also help maintain your nitrogen balance. But of course, one of the most important things is to actually develop um, the, the 
um, background information which will help support your data. And certainly we could show that young people who already had diabetes at an early age actually had deficiencies in their mitochondrial function. And this was at a more systemic level. So this is our ATP production in their peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So this is the circulating leukocytes in their body. And these young people here in the dark purple colour are actually at high risk for developing kidney and cardiovascular disease in the future. And so you can already see, despite them not having kidney disease yet, they actually are already showing a change in their mitochondrial function. This parameter here is how we separated these people into, or these young people with type 1 diabetes, into their risk for future kidney and cardiovascular disease. And you can see here that there is quite a difference in terms of these young people who are at high risk of kidney disease. And we certainly know that they show characteristics of chronic kidney disease, despite not having clinically diagnosed diabetic kidney disease. And this just shows that um, we have a lower um, glomerular filtration rate, which is something which is a measurement of kidney function for every increment of this particular molecule, which is a protein albumin, which is present in our urine. Um, and that actually starts to turn upside down in this high risk population. And when it fully turns upside down is when we would define someone as having chronic kidney disease. We also know that if we take the, the plasma of these patients and we look, we put that onto healthy kidney cells, such as proximal tubule cells, which are the kidney cells which have the highest numbers of mitochondria, that we can in fact induce changes which are reminiscent of diabetic kidney disease in that they start depositing collagens and they also start expressing glucogen, uh, glyco sorry, glucose transport molecules, such as SGLT2. And we know that if we add in mitochondrial therapies, in particular the one that we're looking at, uh, MitoX, we can actually show that this completely goes away. We also know that in preclinical models, we can also get equivalent efficacy in improving this urinary albumin excretion. So this is the appearance of that protein in the urine albumin, which is a marker of progression of kidney disease in those, in, those individual um, mice, or in, in this instance, oh, actually this is mice, um, in these mice, which are treated with MitoX, which is actually equivalent to the best available therapy. And in this example, we've used the ACE inhibitor Ramipol. I don't think I'll talk about that today. Um, and so I, I guess I alluded before to the fact that there is a really important team that's at the basis of all of these discoveries. And that's something which has been enormously facilitated by um, working with JDRF and also thinking about or consistently thinking about the clinical applicability and endpoint that we want to get to in these studies. And as you can see, there are nephrologists, endocrinologists, pediatric um, physicians, um, there's regulatory advisors, Uniquest, mentorship from, from various entrepreneurs. Um, and you can see that it's brought together an enormous amount of people. And of course, there's the Mito X team, which are the biotech company who are responsible for the progression of the therapy that we're particularly interested in. Another aspect that we also need to think about and JDRF encourage us to understand better is to think about the market analysis, because ultimately, if you can't understand the population which you're trying to sell the therapy to or give or provide the therapy to, then you can't actually put it into the market. You need to understand who will do it, who will prescribe it, who will use it, um, and actually whether they will use it or prescribe it. And so there are a number of different um, forecast and market analyses which are available on the internet. Um, they do these for all sorts of diseases. This one is specific to the microvascular complications of diabetes, which include um, diabetic kidney disease, but you will find these available for many different diseases. And they're very useful toolkits to actually help you understand what the market actually looks like. Um, because I guess something in type one diabetes that we're constantly told is that the market is very small. But in fact, when you actually look at the market, this is 2022. So this is just the projected market for microvascular complications, including kidney and eye disease in diabetes or type one diabetes. And it's actually quite large. It's about $6.4 billion. And that actually excludes countries such as China and India, who in fact have the most rapidly growing rates of type 1 diabetes in the world. So you can imagine that 
perhaps our perception of the market is actually not in fact correct. Also, I would encourage you to think very widely about the types of therapies that you're using and consider many of these important aspects. So for example, what biomarkers are you going to use to see how effective your therapy is? It's all very well having a therapy and we know our endpoint our endpoints for our analysis are often very long in terms of diabetic kidney disease, but is there a shorter marker that, or a biomarker that we can use in a very short-term safety study to actually get some idea of whether this therapy is actually providing some um, benefit? Um, how predictive can we use these biomarkers to actually track people who are developing diabetic kidney disease or who are at risk of early death with type 1 diabetes? And how early really can we look at that? Um, and quite to our surprise with some of the data that we've looked at, we actually are in, at the pre-diabetic stage. So we're actually looking at young people who are at risk for diabetes, who don't even have type one diabetes yet. And we can actually tell you which out of those people who are, go are going to develop diabetic kidney disease in the future. How safe and effective is obviously something which is really important. If we're going to be administering something to people, we need to really keep this front and of center of mind or front of mind at all times. Um, this in fact is really important. Um, and also something else though, is how equitable, because some of the populations that we're dealing with are vulnerable populations. And certainly young people with type one diabetes are in fact a vulnerable population. They don't necessarily have a very loud voice. JDRF have obviously changed that and made that a reality. They have now have the ability to advocate and to also bring in funds to help address their disease. But it's very important that we make sure that these um, vulnerable populations are um, being or, or have equitable access to new therapies. And something else finally I just wanted to put in front of you was actually about the target product profile and this goes back to thinking about that north star at the end it looks like a lot of mumbo jumbo but actually what you need to think about is what is the ideal result that you're trying to achieve what actually does it look like are they going to be tablets how often are they going to be taken what is the end point if you're going to do a clinical trial because all of these things actually frame and shape the steps that you need to go through in order to make it in other other words if you're using a biologic you won't be able to have an oral delivery mechanism unless you come up with a mechanism to actually deliver it and protect that protein when it goes into the gut so there are multiple kind of stages that we certainly have had to think about i'm not going to say any more today but i'd love to answer some questions and i'm more than happy to provide any of those other details to people and also to have personal conversations about any of that research that i am able to reveal so thank you Greta and Joe, that was uh, fantastic. Do we have any questions from the room to start with? And I'll just check the chat. Joe, could you just take it off share screen as well? Oh, sorry. Yeah. There we go. So John Hooper's just said excellent strategy and approach. And I think they actually put that up at um, Drota's um, JDRF summary, summary, which is fantastic. Um, uh, Joe, so um, you presented quite clearly how um, some of the ways you were enforced to think by JDRF um, impacted your strategy, but did it actually change some of the types of research that you were doing? Definitely. And so certainly by thinking about what I what I had to get to at the end, I really had to understand the regulatory steps that needed to get me there. So they actually made me think about what the phase three clinical trial looked like. And I thought, I'm nowhere near that. That's ridiculous. Why am I thinking about a phase three clinical trial? But actually by doing that, I understood then as I worked my way backwards, what the other steps were that needed to happen in, for that. And I guess by understanding what, for example, the population. So was I looking at young people? Was I looking at older people? Was I thinking which pop 
which um, was I looking at just type one diabetes or did I also want to include people with type two diabetes, which would expand the marketability of the therapy. And so I, I guess there's many different layers of that that I've had to stop and rethink about as I've worked my way backwards. And, and I guess also talking to the regulators about how long they would anticipate studies to go for, because someone has to pay for it at the end. And also thinking about that is like in terms of the stages that you need to go through the shorter study you can do, the better. Any other? Yes, Mara. Uh, Joe, you touched on uh, how you need to involve lots of experts in, in the field. Um, how difficult is it, is it to do that with IP-related issues? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm fine. Yes, I, you? I did, yeah. Look, IP, I think, is the most complex thing that we have to deal with in this space. Um, it pervades a lot of conversations, but I think if you put that aside, so, so yes, in some instances, we put in place career, um, confidentiality agreements and just had frank conversations. So I've certainly done that, particularly with the entrepreneur. So Darren Kelly is a good example of that. We've just, we just put in place CDAs and he gave me some advice as an entrepreneur. But... Um, I've also had plenty of conversations where I don't talk about the product and we just talk about the general, if, if you were a physician and you wanted this endpoint, what would you do as a clinical trial? What would you be looking for? What are your endpoints? What are your target populations? Tell me about the best design for that study, all of those types of things. So I have done all of those. I've asked, I'm probably the most annoying person in diabetes, I would suspect. <laughs> Because <laughs> I certainly ask a lot of questions of a lot of people. <laughs> Anybody else? Dorota, um, Joe's mentioned that you, you've also been really instrumental, instrumental in driving um, a large data accrual and um, and making sure that that data is is really accessible and um, gets repurposed as much as possible so we get high value for money, which is fantastic. Have you actually encountered any resistance to your approach to um, but how you want to fund and partner with your with the um, academics and researchers you're engaging with, or or has um, people very quickly taken up the mantle? Look, I think I think it's important to um, I think realise that um, we we still do fund very traditional um, discovery research that um, it's too early even to quantify in terms of translational potential. So I think there is a space in our portfolio for a diversity of research. However, when we kind of feel that at certain stage the um, there is a little bit of a vicious circle kind of going, you know. Um, in a, um, in a certain research, um, you know, we, we kind of feel that researchers have to be empowered and offered a support to, to move it to the next stage. And, and then, then the conversations are very positive because we are ultimately on the same journey and the same purpose. So I just really don't really um, feel much pushback. But um, in terms of the, um, the, to give you an example really quickly, for example, we do like to fund sometimes a very critical research infrastructure and by which I mean the, um, we call it Australian um, Diabetes Data Network. This is a very large de-identified data set that is being um, uh, collected in a selected participating clinics and hospitals across Australia that really kind of look at the um, uh, outcomes when the patients can see their doctors at the time of the visit. And um, that data, we, um, which initially has been instigated by, um, you know, clinicians who are collecting data in the small hospitals or larger hospitals being put together into a national platform. And um, together with the researchers, clinicians, we were able to engage with the federal government, for example, to use the data set to evaluate um, the um, subsidy, the international subsidy for the continuous glucose monitoring systems that are being available um, uh, at no cost to um, people with type 1 diabetes under 21. So this real life data is now being used to evaluate that outcome. So we kind of try to really work with the clinicians, but also drive the conversation towards ultimate benefit to the patients, which is, as Josie, you've made affordable and equitable access to the new technologies. So um, that CGM has been proven over and over again by a number of clinical trials that it um, provides really good outcomes for individuals, but unless actually people can access it and the government 
can, can see that they subsidy provide the uh, tangible clinical outcomes that reduce the cost for the, to the health system, it's sometimes hard to connect for them the dots. So we're here to work with the clinicians and the researchers to help them connect those dots. And um, it might be happening in this particular example or with the example that beautifully has been illustrated by Josie when she, as you mentioned, you had to change the way you were designing your experiments to, to kind of being able to engage um, with the um, other entities that drive that North Star um, yeah. outcome. Fantastic, thank you. Now I've done a terrible job of chairing because I've let the session go way over time. Apologies to everybody for that. So unless there's any final questions, we might thank the two speakers again. And